Hi, everybody. Welcome to Authors on the Air. I'm your host, Pam Stack. We're proud to be part of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. I am so excited because my friend Jeff Abbott is here. I think this is like our maybe our fourth interview. Every year you come out with a book and, and I invite you on the show and you were so gracious to say yes. Thank you for that, Jeff. How are Thanks. you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me again, Pam. I really I, I love speaking with you. It's always I, I learn something new every time I talk to you. So um, thank you for being here. I want to display your book. The new one is called An Ambush of Widows. Um, and I have to start by first of all saying that this is your close to 20th book, Jeff, is it? I think it's actually number 21. 21. I, I knew it was a I have your books on the stacks back here someplace, you know, and I won't let them go because they're some of my favorite books. Um, you don't, you don't necessarily write series every time. At least the past couple of years, you haven't written your, your signature series character. Have you? No. Uh -uh. Yeah. The last four books have been standalones. Yeah. And they've been great. They've been a lot of fun. Oh, um, when, you know, a lot of people know that I read an awful lot. And so some people say, well, how do you know if you're going to like a book or not? And I always say, I know in the first page. Now, some people give it the first chapter or get halfway through the book and say, oh, no, I, I'm just I can't get into it. Mm -hmm. I have an embarrassment of riches. I get a lot of books from publishers and publicists and author friends and all. And so I I feel like I don't have to go through half the book. I can tell on the first page. So when I open Ambush of Widows, dang, if you didn't start off in the fourth chapter with everything happening. So I just want to let kind of let listeners and, and viewers know how it starts. What starts off with Kristen North, who is the, wife of a murdered man, although she doesn't know it, not even three paragraphs down, somebody calls on her cell phone and it, they are calling from her, her husband's cell phone. And they say, your husband is dead. He was murdered in Austin, Texas. It's unlike anything I've ever read before. And you know, I read a lot. Where in the world did you come up with this premise? Your your brain just amazes me because you always have something different going on. But this is totally unlike anything, anything I've ever read. Well, I, you know, I wanted to have her sort of be in the last moments of her normal life. Um, Kirsten is sitting at home. Uh, she's done the things she does when her husband's out of town on a business trip. She's gotten Chinese food. She's binging her favorite Netflix show. He hasn't talked to her in a couple of days, which we know is unusual. And then she sees his phone come, number come up. And then this, this anonymous voice is telling her that her husband is dead and he's dead in Austin, which can't be right because he was on a business trip to New York. And so she then sort of very methodically starts trying to explain away what this phone call is but she can't when she googles about a shooting in austin she's been told her husband's been shot and she sees that two men have been shot in a warehouse two nights ago and one is unidentified and that's when she decides to go to austin and start investigating this but i i wanted her to have sort of her moment of normalcy not for very long Boy, no um, uh, to before her world unravels and then sort of follow her as she deals with a massively suddenly unraveled world because her husband has lied to her about where she is. And they're in a very, very, very tight marriage where it's sort of the two of them against the world. And so him lying to her is not typical behavior. Um, so I just, I like to start with, you know, a moment of high drama, but also in that moment of high drama, a character making a choice. I think, you know, if I found out that a loved one of mine was dead, I would just want to curl up in a ball for about the next six months. And instead with Kirsten, her anger and her, 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 
her fury, yes, her fury yes. drives yeah. her that she's going to not only find out what happened to her husband, she's going to make whoever did this to him pay. So before you jump forward, though, the interesting thing to me is that that she makes a decision to go to Austin because she's got to know what's going on. But she doesn't realize that that sets a chain of actions in motion that were she not have gotten uh, gone to the airport, she might not be telling her story. That's and right. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to give that away because it's, it's just in the very beginning. This is not even the end of the first chapter. We also learn about the wife of the man who was killed in the warehouse with her husband. Mm -hmm. She's they, the other widow. Right, the other she widow. Two, at least two widows to have an ambush of widows because ambush is the collective noun for a group of widows, which I did not know. Me. I didn't know what that was, you know? I, I, I thought, oh my God, they're, the widows are gonna get ticked off and they're going after someone. Oh, well, that, that part does happen. Right. Yeah, it's, it, it was, I was about a hundred pages into, and I'll come back to your question about four in a second, okay. uh, but uh, uh, not to get off, off track, right. but um, because everyone has been saying, where did you come up with the title? And I'm like, the title fell in my lap. I'm too lazy to have come up with this good of a title. It fell in my lap because I was about a hundred and 120 pages into writing it and I didn't really have a title for the book. And then I thought at some point there was a, someone had a reason to refer to them as a group, you know, a pair of widows. I'm, what would you, is there a name for a pair of widows? Because I'd heard of, you know, a parliament of owls an impatience right. of wives, you know, yeah. these sort of Her pros and all those, right. And right. Kindness of ravens, these really great collective nouns. I thought surely there must be one for widows. I looked it up and it was an ambush of widows. And I thought, is someone saying that because they think widows are going to ambush you? Or do you think that widows are dangerous? Because a widow is maybe freed from some of the convention unpredictable. and unpredictable. Yeah, yeah. And, and how did she become a widow? And then I saw the other time that ambush is used as a collective noun is for tigers. And that is pointed out in the book when Kirsten learns that's what a group of widows is called as an ambush of widows. And someone says, isn't it interesting that the other, the other group that collective noun is applied to as tigers who are fierce and unpredictable and are going to do what they want. And that I think kind of applied to the widows as well. But so that's where the title came from and it fell on me. And it, when I, and I was like, well, I hope my publisher likes this because I really like this title. And fortunately they, they really leaned into it as well and supported it. But you mentioned that the other widow enters the story, uh, the widow of the um, man in Austin in the warehouse, uh, whose name is Adam Zhang. And he is a very high profile technology angel investor and lives a very privileged life as opposed to the Norths who, who are kind of really struggling to get by. And his wife, Flora, uh, she's a new mother. She's, they have about a one-year-old, a toddler. Um, she has sort of subsumed her life in, to her husband to be the supportive wife, to be the good hostess for the business deals she had a very promising career as a journalist and she decided to put it aside. But their marriage is a little bit different from the North. It's a little more strained. Um, things are not quite as happy. That said, he is still her husband. She loves him. As the father of her son, the loss is devastating. So, but I was dealing with two very different personalities in Kirsten and Flora. Kirsten's the kind to kick in the door and come in storming and demand answers. And Flora is more diplomatic, more thoughtful, more reserved. Right. She was a little harder to get to know as a character. Kirsten was sort of jumping off the page and grabbing me by the throat from the beginning. And Flora wasn't. And I had to really, this will sound strange because they're fictional characters. I had to spend more time with Flora. And her, her revealing of herself came more slowly. And it was only kind of when I got her into new situations with other characters 
that she felt she could show more of herself. Yeah. Um, but I really enjoyed writing her because she is a more thoughtful, measured character than Kirsten. And I, I, I'm, I'm terrible. I wanted to handcuff these two women together emotionally. They don't have a lot of reason to believe or trust each other, but they are bound for life because their husbands died together. Died together. Neither yeah. one of them knows the truth about this. So, so I'm not going to give away a whole lot about the book, but but just the first three or four chapters, um, you've thrown out enough bait there to chum the waters for the shark. So. So naturally, when I started reading about, you know, about Flora and then Teddy, the yeah. you know, I'm buzzing all over the place with that. And then I'm buzzing all over with Jeannie and the, the neighbor and everything. And I'm thinking, OK, why is Teddy being so cavalier? I know he's the protege and all that. So I, I like that, that you're throwing out bits of bait there. And already, you know, I'm. I mean, give me a mystery. I want to solve it. But what are you doing? Why are you know, Mender and everybody else? Why are these people here? What's really going on? The the two murder victims, too, are so polar opposite just in their business life. Kirsten's husband wants to be involved in cybersecurity and tech and all. Well, Flora's husband is a billionaire from it. Correct. He's he's made a lot of money. He's made he. I think they say at one point, um, Flora has fifty million reasons to want him dead. Um, you know, I I wanted to put these characters really just in polar opposition to each other. There's a point she's in shock, but Kirsten. It takes her about two or three days. She realizes with Henry gone, she may not be able to afford their apartment. Flora's. Relie Flora's relieved she doesn't have to move into a penthouse that Adam bought that she did not like as well as their mansion, you know, and just, they're just got different, different problems um, to do it. Yeah, but the world needs a difference. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, and it, but, but, but death is the great equalizer, right? It is. Indeed. You know? So both these men are dead. And and the lives they left behind have been left behind, and the and it's the two widows that are having to deal with the consequences and and the aftermath and the wreckage of it, um, which you talked about in the first chapters, kind of chumming the waters, which I've never heard it described that way. That's so great. I'm totally going to steal that. Good. But, <laughs> no, I, yeah. What I am trying to do is that at heart, this is a this a lot of this is family drama. Because Flora has a family where Teddy, who is her husband's cousin and sort of his protege that he's grooming now that he's gotten his MBA and, and Teddy lives with them. And, you know, Flora has a young child. Her neighbors, Jean and Milo, are very helpful to her. They're very close. They're like surrogate grandparents um, for her grandson. And they're sort of her support system and her sounding board. Um, her husband's business partner and his wife are also really prominent. And on Kirsten's side, she has a foster brother. We, we kind of learn as the book goes on that Kirsten was in some unfortunate foster care situations in New Orleans where she grew up and then she got into a good one. And in that good one was her foster brother, Zach. But Zach works for an organized crime ring in, in New Orleans, which is really annoying to Kirsten. She doesn't love that. And, um, uh, you know, but he's her family. She, she he, yeah. he's, her, he's her foster brother, but he's her brother in every way that counts. And they don't, they, they, they fuss like, like siblings do. And I wanted him to be sort of this threatening to everyone else kind of finds him threatening and she thinks right. he's sort of a teddy bear. Um, but I wanted to have that relationship because she, she's alone now. Right. Henry was her, her husband was her whole world. So both of these women are as that you would falling back on the relationships that are important to them. But these relationships are also complicating factors in terms of how, where this investigation is going. In some cases, the people who were close to her and close to her husband could have been involved in the crime. And we don't know yet. We don't know anything. Right. So um, we know there's a hitman. 
who's out there trying to clean up this mess. And he's sort of an atypical hitman. His name is Minder. And what I decided to do with him to make him different was to give him project management problems in that he, he commits a murder. From jump. From jump. <laughs> from, yeah, he commits a murder. So he follows the protocol of getting rid of the weapon. And then he has to immediately ask to commit another murder. And he's thrown away a perfectly good weapon. So now he has to acquire another clean gun. And his wife is about to have a baby. And he, the wife is not happy that he's not home. Why is this job taking so long? Should he be even taken to this job? You know, he's he, he's like, you know, now I'm just going to not work for the first six months that the baby's born. These are not the eight. These are kind of atypical hitman problems. Right. But the, I wanted the to get The chart isn't, isn't kind of flowing the way he wanted right, it to. Exactly. <laughs> right. You know, he's, he's worried about profit and loss and 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 should he be spending the time on this and gosh it's just gotten so much more complicated now uh because nothing went smoothly someone didn't do something they thought they would do and it's messed the entire project up and so he was actually sort of fun to write as a hitman hitman can sort of feel very cliched at times and i i really did actually sort of enjoy writing him but i wanted to introduce this web of people around them who are going to complicate what they're in the the two widows investigation they're going to be either helpers at times or obstacles at times and i wanted because i just wanted to make it tough for them because they need to rely on each other more and more and more as the book progresses it's kind of the ultimate buddy book in a way <laughs> you wouldn't expect it's the female buddy book you know these and i want to go back to mender because uh, i you catch that immediately when he gets off the, when he finds out that Kirsten is on the way to the airport, he's gotten off, you know, and figures he's screwed because he's already gotten rid of the weapon. Now he's going to go back on the plane and try to be unobtrusive to her. And they end up sitting next to each other in the very back of the plane. I am the cruelest person. Oh, oh it was just, perfect. It was just to it was, put it. I mean, and when that was one of the breakthrough, I did not have that scene sort of in the original draft, but you know, it's like it, how upsetting it would be for a hitman who arrives in New Orleans and sees his target hurrying past him in the airport with a duffel bag. She's right. getting on a flight. He's come to New Orleans to kill her. And then he has to pretend that his, his dad's got a medical condition. He's got to fly right back to where, to Austin, where he was. And he and her had bought the last two seats on the plane. Right. So guess what? They're right next to each other. And it he was, can't be terrified to recognize him. But it I is wanted... sublime. I have to tell you, uh, <laughs> no one does misdirection like you do, Jeff. Uh, in every single book, like I say, there's all of these things going on. And it's so much fun. It's so gratifying. I to just read want, that kind of a book. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to just talk over you just then, but I really, talk really, it. no, no. But it was like, you know, I'm always saying like, how can I heighten this, the suspense of the scene? If he just gets a phone call and says, well, she's left New Orleans, she's in Austin, find her in Austin. That's not particularly interesting for no. a reader, but I have to put them in, in physical proximity to each other. And she, he's saying, please don't remember my face. And she's thinking my husband is dead. And, and, and we don't know, did Minder kill her husband? We don't know anything at this point we, yet. We really don't. Yeah. So we just know that he's been charged with, with getting rid of Kirsten. And, you know, she's also struggling because she has had an issue with alcohol in the past and the other, the nice guy, the non-killer in the row has, has drink coupons and she takes one and she oh, gets a beer. Door. And, you know, I'm just, it, the whole scene is nothing. They're sitting on a plane. And when you fly from New Orleans to Austin, it's like an elevator. It goes up quickly, comes down quickly. Down, right. and, and, and well, and that's actually Houston. They're changing planes in Houston. It's even faster. And you sh sh like that. Then I thought, how do I make, how do I make two people, how do I make this flight fraught with drama, right? Because then he has to figure out how is he going to follow her? Where is she going in Austin? Without he her remembering, without her remembering who he is. Right. And so we, we, 
I wanted to make every, I'm trying to make every page tense, even when it's two people sitting on a plane. Well, it, it definitely was that. I mean, it, when I opened the book, it grabbed me immediately. And then it was just, it was like, kind of like the pile on, you know, I, I'm thinking, oh, Jeff's doing it again. I'm never going to figure it out. <laughs> when I get, I, I'll be all the way to the last page and you'll throw another red herring and then it'll be the next page that actually resolves. It's so much fun to read. I, I want to just, I just got to show the book again before we go on and talk about other things too. This is called An Ambush of Widows and it is amazing. Oh, let me, oh, I guess I should back up like that. So well, I did have people ask, I, people have called it an ambush of windows given the two <laughs> windows on the cover. Yeah, I, it well, I, I, love, I love, absolutely, I love this cover. I think it's one of the best covers that I've had. I, I do too. We did, get, we did get tickled about it, but I, I was like, the artist did such a fantastic job and I just love, the sort of the separation of the two women, um, Absolutely. and one is one is one is covered with blinds, and the other is looking out. So I love it. So I'm very happy with how it turned. The out. last time you and I spoke was July last year. We were talking about your. We were talking about writing, not actually about your book. I think we had spoken earlier in the year about your book, um, and we talked about a lot about writing and character and plot lines and everything. I don't remember if you told me. And I think it was no, but I could be wrong. If you outlined or not, or did you do kind of like a a little bullet point? I'm not sure how much you did. Um, well, my publisher likes for me to turn in an outline. And so I write one for my editor. We've just found this to be a useful part of the process for both of us. I write, I write one for my editor that's fairly detailed. Um, I may have some cheats in there. Like suddenly she discovers the truth, but I don't say how she discovers the truth. Right. Um, and that's usually eight to 10 pages. And then I'll write like a two page outline for the senior execs at the publisher that my editor will want to show something to. And that's very jacket copy kind of feeling with more detail than you would have in a jacket copy, but just kind of sort of the tone and the theme of the book, kind of where I'm envisioning it at that point. Now, I, I try to follow the outline once I get started. Often, I mean, every time, I think of new ideas or characters mm -hmm. interact in sort of unexpected ways to open doors, like that scene on the airplane and in the airport wasn't in the original outline. Um, and they've never once said, but in the outline, you said this, right, you know, they're, right, always, right. they're always happy. So I try to keep the process somewhat loose. But when I get to about the final hundred pages of the book, I stop. I reread the draft up to that point, And then I sort of do a more detailed outline for the last hundred pages, just making sure I'm hitting all the points I want to make, that I'm emotionally resolving, you know, the, the, the subplots. You know, does everything feel like everything is sort of coming together, you know, tightly? Um, and that that one's probably a bit more detailed because I'm very, sometimes I'm very exploratory in the, the outline as I'm writing it. You know, I, I give myself permission to sort of, um, to jump around. I mean, I think in the original outline, um, I didn't, I was going to have all the scenes from Flora and Kirsten's viewpoint and no other. And once I got into the writing and started making some shifts with Mender, I was like, that's not going to work. I need to see this from his viewpoint as well. So even, so, even outline, outline, doing, doing, doing an organic writing, writing. writing, you're organically writing the story because obviously if you have, you're, you're, I'm assuming that you're visualizing the story in your head as you're writing. So if something new comes along, you can't be stuck to a, uh, an outline. If yeah. you think it's better, you've got to be able to change it, right? Yeah. And but sometimes it's making the new idea fit into the outline. It doesn't necessarily, I mean, this could be, the idea could be, you know, a character insight or an extra scene that shows us more of that character that I didn't include in the outline, but it's still okay. It may not affect the plot. Sometimes there are things that will affect the plot and I sort of have to reconcile that. I mean, I do find it useful to know what is the end destination? What is the end scene going to be, right? What is the climax of the story? 
and if I don't have that in mind, then do I have the scene right before that where I have an idea yeah. of how, how things are going to come together? So it's kind of an iterative process. I don't think outlines should be things that you handcuff yourself to. Right. I think of them as scaffolding. Yes. But I also wouldn't try to build a house without a blueprint. I mean, right. it's 100,000 to 110,000 words. It's a, it's a big undertaking. And I, so I like to have an idea of the structure and the flow and where I'm going to go. Um, yeah, you need your foundation and your walls. Kind so of. Or it can, it can all stay together. I, I mean, that makes sense to me. I um, might just build a big patio if no one stops me. You know, I need, I need the kitchen, I need the bathroom. <laughs> so, how about, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit about research. A lot of writers are, are very intuitive, and you've written, like you said, this is your 21st book. Do you need to research? anything specifically about your writing process or maybe only maybe a location, the name of an airport or things like that. I, it, how much research is involved for you specifically? Well, I, I, the last four books have all been set in a fictional Austin suburb called Lake Haven, right. which is not that different from where I live. All right when I'm writing the Sam Capra books and they're taking place in these far flung lo locales. Um, and the book I'm writing right now is a Sam Capra, Sam Capra number six. So um, I, I have to do, you know, I, I tend to write either about locations where I've spent a lot of time or I specifically go there and I do research on the location, excuse me. But um, like for this one, um, you know, I actually have known people who were technology investors because I worked for technology companies in Austin in the past. So the world of Adam Zhang was not entirely alien to me. I knew people who have been successful investors and sort of the, the personality type that can be involved in there, except they were all way nicer than, than Adam is. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, and I've also spent a lot of time in New Orleans because I was writing this book under somewhat compressed schedules. So I picked two places where I had enough familiarity to write with confidence. Right. Um, I don't know what it is to be a widow, obviously, <laughs> or a widower, thank God. Um, I, I, I've, I've, you know, I did read some accounts, you know, I talked to some friends um, just about how you sort of deal with sort of the emotional shock of all of it. Someone I'm close to became a widow while I was in the course of writing the book. Um, and so, you know, there are some things that I will invest time in researching, but then there's this like other things that were details. Like it took me just because I have enough familiarity with New Orleans Naming the Catholic school that Kirsten and Zach go to took me 40 minutes. I couldn't just <laughs> call out a name. I couldn't just call it St. Anthony's, right? There, I wanted a school. I want, okay, I had to think about, okay, it needs to be a saint. It needs to be a lesser known saint. I don't want it to have already been used in a past or present New Orleans school. Where is the school at? And then picking their surnames. And because I have a lot of friends in New Orleans, I said, if I just named, People in New Orleans will read this and go, "That's not. That's not how that is." <laughs> I even named even named uh, the cafe uh, uh, where where Kirsten and Zach meet at one point in the book after a friend of mine uh, in New. He's a New Orleans lawyer, so I better get it right because he's a lawyer, right? So you know, I I pull on things like that uh, sometimes from the existing well of knowledge. This book didn't require. I mean, my last book never asked me, which involved right. overseas adoption. You know, right. that was a lot more research. I mean, yeah, I, I would imagine I had files of original paperwork of adoptees, so I could see wow. what all they were asked and you know, what were the visits like when when they went overseas to to go to the orphanage and then to go back to pick up their child and that period of adjustment afterwards that, you know, I knew nothing about that. So that was sort of a starting point for me. Um, so let me ask you something when you're writing, I, I mean, I'm curious if like you're saying you did some research about the, the, the cafe and the church, the school and everything else. Do your readers ever call you out on stuff? 
And, you know, do they say, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not right. It's not on that street or. Well, that's why I'm using a fictional place as much as I can, because right. they say, I mean, like I had to even make sure that a Chinese restaurant that gets mentioned that there wasn't one by that name in New <laughs> World. Because yes, because there have been times I've used real restaurant or things like that or street names and then the street name changes or, you know, we have, um, there is a, the Colorado river, the part that runs right through downtown Austin has was for years called town Lake. And when lady bird Johnson died, they renamed it lady bird Lake. Right. Because she had done so much to preserve and beautify it. And she was always down there and it was a lovely honor, but I have got, I mean, these books are like 20 years old mentioning town Lake. And some was, well, that is not the name of it. Have you ever been to Austin? I'm like, that is 20 years ago, y'all. You know, uh, you, it's, it's, it's just sort of funny. Um, okay. Yeah, if I get something wrong, readers have always let me know. Um, I always respond politely to that. Um, you know, if I got I, I, I hope they're gracious to you when they when when they think you're getting it wrong and, and try to remember this is fiction, but you know Well it it you know, and I understand there, you know, there are things that should you want it to you want it to be right. You know, I don't want to make mistakes. No, I understand. Um, but I've also, you know, there have been times like where in terms of say police procedural or illegal, you know, I may bend things slightly to increase the drama. I'm always careful to say the experts told me the experts are not to blame if I had something wrong. Right. It's always me if I had something wrong. But right. Interesting. Um, are you going to BoucherCon this year? I am not. I am not going. Waiting for another year before you venture I out. As much as I love New Orleans, and I'm not afraid of New Orleans in August. I've been to New Orleans in August before, and I cannot be beaten down with humidity further. Oh my God, uh, please. It is so wicked nasty. It's going to be wicked. For hurricanes be, there. But it's also, it, yes, well, it's also New Orleans, and I love New Orleans, and I've spent a lot of time there. Um, but I just kind of, I, I personally wasn't quite ready for a gathering of that size. I mean, I know bookstores are, are gonna be starting to do actual events again. And, you know, I've done virtual events with a couple of the really wonderful mystery bookstores the past week, and they've both said they're kind of restarting, but it's slow and it's right. measured. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's probably appropriate. Um, well, but I do- I'm, I'm hiding from everyone. I'm not going, well, first of all, I live in Southwest Florida. Elsa just passed through here. But before that, we had six weeks straight of torrential rain, which, oh. you know, came through the roof of my apartment. So, and oh, no. came down the windows. So I'm not in any hurry to go any place that has a target on their back, like New Orleans and, and Florida. If yeah. there's a hurricane, they'll find us. It's yeah. like waving the flag saying, here, come and get us. It's humid. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> Uh, that's why we have air conditioning here in Southwest Florida. I'm not in a hurry. Yep, and yep. Besides, you know, every every conference you go to, where does everyone congregate? They congregate in, in the bar. And they're cheek to jowl in there. I'm just not ready for that much closeness yet. It, it, <laughs> I mean, that is sort of the wonderful thing about conferences is it that is. they're crowded and you get to see everyone. It is. A lot of time Because, I mean, let's, it's sort of a gathering. It's an ambush of introverts, you know. Yeah. It, it's It's... <laughs> A lot of us who are heavy readers and writers, we may not socialize as much as other folk. And this is the this is our tribe. This is our group. Yes. Great to get together with everyone. I'm just kind of I think I want us to be a little further along. You know, I, I agree with you. And and me not being an introvert at all, the big mouth in the group. <laughs> yeah. I am. I, <laughs> I'm the one saying, come on, let's do interviews, everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so, yeah. But, uh, but I understand the, the, you know, the necessity to kind of back away. I'll wait. I'll wait until we go up to the Northwest, you know, or Midwest, wherever we're going next year, I, I think. Um, what are you doing in your spare time? Ha ha, spare time for a writer. Um, well, I'm spending time with my sons. Uh, my oldest son has just graduated from college and is going to be moving halfway across the country for his first real job soon. Um, so my wife, he's, he's at home this summer. 
Um, and uh, my youngest son just finished his freshman year of college and he's at home and he's working part time. And so we're mostly just having family time together before uh, my oldest flies the nest <laughs> uh, completely, which I'm still kind of mentally wrapping my head around. Head around yeah. Your, your baby boy is leaving. Yes, he's, one, he's, he's my baby boy who was six foot four and <laughs> <taller than me. laughs> uh, innocent little in infant that he is. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, but we're so proud of him and we're so excited for him to be starting this next chapter in his life. So right. I'm this is what you raise him for to kind of scoot him out and be successful. You know, yeah, you, you, yeah, you I'm, hope I'm 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 actually glad that, you know, he 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 graduated in May and then his job was not starting till August. So we actually are getting time with him um, well, that, that, you know, we were, we're lucky. We're lucky because some, you know, some jobs would have started much sooner and uh, he's starting and, but he's gotten his apartment up there. And so we're all, we're all thrilled for him. Oh, I think that's wonderful. Congratulations. You raised a good one and yeah. you're raising another good one. So Jeff, um, I know that generally you write a book kind of a year before it's released. So, you know, how, however often it does, I mean, you, you may have turned it in six months ago and it's coming out. I'm, I'm not really sure a year ago, two years ago, whatever it is. Do you write constantly between the launch of this book and your next book, which, which will be Sam Capra? Do you have a space in between or do you just jump right in? Well, I, with both the boys being in private universities, I went back to having a day job, which I had been writing full time for 14, 15 years. And then I went back to having a day job where I'm a creative director at a uh, advertising marketing agency. Oh, and so um, that's a very demanding job. Um, and so I'm having to write in the mornings before work, in the evenings after work, and on the weekends. Um, and so I can't, I mean, the only reason I'm waiting is generally as soon as I've turned in the book, I've written the outline or the proposal for the next one. And then they, my publisher has to decide, does that, you know, is this something we're interested in? Which was sort of how we got to Sam Capra number six. I'd written five Sam Capras and then I wrote four standalones. And then I had an idea for, and I had really put Sam Capra through the ringer in those five books. And yes, he, you did. <laughs> and um, I, I, um, I wrote a proposal for a short proposal for a standalone and a proposal for the next Sam Capra, just in case, because we have television interest in Sam. We have a, a, a known showrunner who is trying to develop the yes. books into a series. And so there was kind of like, you know, I think maybe this might be a good time to do another Sam novel that I gave it some real thought. OK, I I've, I've, I wrote the five books that I wrote in a row with Sam and now I've had this break. What what is the next Sam novel going to be that I've taken a breath and Sam has taken a breath? So I wrote those fairly quickly. And my publisher said, Sam, number six is there the one I would like to do. And so which I'm really excited about because I, wow. I love writing the standalones, but I love people were asking me, I would get Sam. asked every week if I was writing another Sam book um, and had I given up on Sam or had I abandoned Sam? Like he was a child at the grocery, you know, <laughs> um, I'm like Sam is off doing whatever he's doing. He's just fine. You know, but if you're, yeah, if you're, if your listeners are not familiar with those books, um, they're, they are um, uh, uh, more high octane than the Lake Haven books. Uh, right. Sam is a former CIA agent who um, owns, ends up owning bars all around the world. And through the bars, he encounters people uh, who he might help with his, his former spy skills. And, but he's also a father. Uh, my favorite description of Sam, I mean, I used to describe Sam, I would say like if Rick from Casablanca met Jason Bourne, that would be kind of it. But then there was someone who, who said Sam was Jason Bourne with a baby Bjorn. Uh, <laughs> I, I love the idea of him you know, fighting bad guys with a baby strapped to him. You know, why not? Yeah. Uh, but um, 
yeah, I he was kind of a different style of action hero and being a bit younger, being a bit less jaded, being on the outs from the U.S. intel community because of some things that had happened with him. And that opened up a lot of opportunities for me. So I've always loved writing him. But I will say, after having written four suburban suspense novels, that first time I was like trying to write the high octane action sequence with him having to fight, you know, bad guys in an enclosed space. And I'm like, how did I used to do this? I used to, it's like riding a bike, right? I used to know how to do this. And so you have I, to get up I, in your office and do all the maneuvering and the action yourself. <laughs> but you know, so it's so interesting to me. There's such different type of books. The four that, that I've spoken to you about, plus the Sam's that I have on my shelves, they're so totally different. I mean, and I'm, I can't say I'm partial to one or the other, but if I had my druthers, I'd be reading Sam all the time. Cause I kind of am a little bit of a spy nut, you know, that caper spy uh, government, former government guy. I love all that stuff. This is the I funny thing to me, because I think when I first thought about the Capra series, I think they thought it was going to be, an overwhelmingly male readership. But with him having a wife who vanishes, a baby he has to take care of, and then just sort of the way that I think he approaches helping people, it is, he has a, it is a predominantly female readership. I hear from tons of women about Sam Capra. And it's not like they're romanticizing him. I think they're like, but a lot of them have said, I read this book because a friend recommended it. And this is the kind of, this is the only kind of book I can get my husband to read. So it's like wives getting their husbands to read Sam, which is funny to me because I think they thought it would be maybe the other way around. Um, but well, there's you some right on, my, on my Facebook page, you know, one of my, one of my friends on Facebook was saying, do you write the Sam Capper books? And you're like, yep, that's me. And right. that's been, that's like five years ago, five, yeah, yeah, yeah. five years ago, I think yeah. for the well, last one. So uh, she remembered immediately that. So, uh, so listen, uh, if there's a spy thriller going on, I want to know about it. I yeah. love all that stuff. Well, I mean, you. I think I have back here someplace, you know, my, my Jason Bourne and, and all the other ones, you know, everything is all back there on the show. I love that stuff. Yeah. I started reading spy thrillers when David Morrell wrote Brotherhood of the Rose. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's what turned me on. I have my original paperback. When I met him years ago, I, you know, crawled up to him with my book. It was the pages were tattered and torn. I taped them all together. John Land laughed at me. He said, Pam, break down and buy a new book. And I said, no, no. And David didn't want me to either, you know. So I have that scraggly taped together I, cover. I love it when someone brings me a book that is well loved. Oh, and those are the you books know, that I read over and over. That's the greatest read. compliment. It's yeah. the greatest compliment that someone reread it, re-engaged re with the story, with the characters. It's wonderful. Do you have any books that you like to reread? Oh, sure. Who do you like I to reread? Actually, I actually... During the pandemic, I kind of went in a reread mode. How cool. You know, it was probably more for comfort. And some of mine are really diametrically opposed. Like you right. would say, like, these, these authors don't overlap. But I started a reread. Well, after the fire where right. we lost our home. Your, and all your books. Oh my gosh. I lost over 2,000 books. I didn't lose all of them, but I lost a most lot. of them. I know. Uh, but like the first series, I bought the entire series back it, it, in one fell swoop were the Travis McGee novels oh, by John yes. McDonald. Of course, John Bina Which are nice, nice out in these really nice trade paperbacks now because my eyes are not as good as they were with the pulpy paperbacks when A I long started. Long time ago when we got them off the spinning rack, right? That's Exactly right. And, and, and I have all the colors lined up with all the colors in the title and I am not through rereading all of them, but I've just been sort of grabbing and dipping into them. And in some respects, you know, they feel like a very much a product of the time. Yes. And in other respects, they are really timeless in talking about human nature yes. or greed or cruelty or nobility of, of spirit, you know, where it, 
I, I still learn from writing, from reading them, you know, and even where they, they can feel like they fall a little bit short or feel just more tied to the time. I, you know, I still understand what he was going for in terms of his effect, in terms of, of making that connection with the reader. The other author I went on a rereading binge is Josephine Tay who oh. only did about eight novels and is is, no relation. is is a very British writer. Yes. Um, but each of her novels, you can tell the same person wrote it, but the novels are so different, you know. Um, um, and, and I think probably my favorite of all of them is The Daughter of Time, where she set herself the challenge of the detective has two broken legs, he's stuck in a hospital, and he solves a, a 400-year-old mystery. Uh, that it, because the daughter of you know the daughter of time is supposed to be history, right. um, and I was like, how did she? You know, I read the book ages ago, and I don't think I really appreciated it. But then going back and in 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 rereading Josephine Tainel for like Brat Farrar, which is about someone assuming someone else's identity, that I believe she wrote before the talented Mister Ripley, right? But um, just the, the the construction of the novels yes. is so impeccable. If you're just reading them just for fun, you'll just be pulled along. But if you're looking at them as an author, as a fellow author, to say, how did she do this? I just think she's an underappreciated genius. I think she's up there with Sayers or Christie or Marsh. Oh, I, there's no doubt. You yeah. know, I notice when I read some of my old ones, you know, Len Dayton and I read, um, uh, you name them, you know, all those old in the John D. McDonald type of uh, genre and time. The writing is very compact. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't lessen the story at all. You're not missing out on a storyline and you're not missing out on mystery, the thrill or trying to unwind what's going on. But it's, they're very compact. I mean, I look back, you know, even Parker, Robert Par Robert B. Parker, when he was writing, those books were not that big. No. They were, and Travis McGee, I think, was like 200 pages or something. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, I think they're every bit as good as any bestseller nowadays. And, yeah. and like you and Jeff Deaver, a lot of people always say to me, you know, it's an economy of words. You can overtell a story. And um, and it when I read something like that, it makes me feel like the writer thinks I'm stupid and they have to explain every little thing. I sometimes feel there's almost pressure to make books bigger. And there's something to be said. If you go and you look at like how you were pointing at McDonald. Right. Tay. Right. Parker, that the books are not, they're not James Mishner books. No, they are, are, they're, they're slim, they're tight. They're told with, not just with economy, but with punch. And I feel that's a perfectly fine form for us to admire and to possibly go back to, especially in a time where people have less time to read. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like, yeah, I because I've been reading some big, thick books lately, which should be big, thick books. They're, they're that kind of story. But um, there's something to be said for the power of a short economical read that still has a big payoff. Emotional. Yes, and, yeah. And, well, and like Dutch Leonard that. was really the master of all that. Elmore Leonard, you know, who said, don't write stuff people don't want to read. And it's just, I mean, it's it, it's kind of like one of those Yogi Berra type or whoever was the coach for the Yankees that used to always say the crazy words. You know, don't write stuff people don't want to read. Really, in its foolishness and its simplicity, it really makes a lot of sense. You know, don't, you have to give readers, I think, the benefit of intelligence so that you don't have to write down every sentence of every step the character is taking or describe the background so that it looks like a photograph. Just, you, do you, does that make sense to you as a writer? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, you know, I think sometimes we're, we're trying so hard to paint the picture that we could overpaint it. Um, I mean, someone who, I adored and is widely adored in the mystery community is was Mary Higgins Clark. Yes. And she was 
so wonderful and so generous. But I love, this was her favorite story to tell on herself was that she said she got a letter from a read, from a young, very young reader who said, I love all your books, even the boring parts. That was one of her favorite stories to tell on herself because we would all just start to laugh, but there was a point to it there, that there is. we have to remember so, and 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 what one reader finds boring, another reader can find very compelling. Yes. But to always keep that in mind, don't don't have a boring part. Right. If you can all avoid it. And, and of course, Mary was an absolute, you know, goddess of suspense. Oh, yeah, and, she's brilliant. A master, you know, master at creating suspense and building tension and what have you. And I can't remember any boring parts in any of her books. But I love that she told that story on her, you know, that she told that story because it was like even her with all her success, that was a helpful reminder that we all need to have, you know. To, 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 I want to do five quick questions and five quick answers, then I'm going to let you go because I know you have lots of things to do. So um, every writer has tools that they bring with them when they sit down to write, the writer's toolbox, so to speak. What is in your writer's toolbox that's most important to you? Whoops. He's gone. He's going to show me. My notebook. I, I keep a notebook. I keep a notebook with uh, all my ideas and all my thoughts, uh, the bad ideas, the good ideas, all of that. And so it's sort of the place where I can explore without exploring on the page if I'm not ready to explore on the page. So I draw in it. I doodle in it. I'm, I write notes about characters. I think, what if? I might just write what if at the top of the page and then I let the other sub ideas from that fall out and it might be a bad idea, might be a good idea, but I just like to have a place to collect my thoughts. Interesting. Um, when you are out and about in public, which I know this past year has been limiting, but do you ever observe people talking or moving and think, I'm going to create a picture or I, you, in your mind, you automatically create a scene maybe from a book. Mm, not so much for that. Um, I think sometimes I've seen like unusual interactions between people and I wonder what's the story. Um, but I don't know that I'm pulling that much from what I'm observing right around me and transplanting it. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes maybe so. Yeah. Are you one who listens to music or needs background noise or do you need absolute quiet when you're writing? I like to listen to music. I like to listen to my favorite things to listen to are Miles Davis, Massive Attack, uh, film soundtracks. I love listening to films. And, and actually, my sons have gotten me onto game soundtracks. There are game soundtracks that are just as dramatic as action yeah. film soundtracks. Yeah. yeah uh, somebody else told me they like film sound soundtracks too. I think that's really interesting. Is it the orchestral part of it? The symphony? Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yep. Um, if you hear voices, lyrics, does that kind of mess around with you or do you not, you not don't hear? Necessarily. I mean, I'll listen to Massive Attack or Cascade when I'm writing and they both have, but they're more, you know, electronic and right. so there's not as many lyrics, but, or the lyrics are more muted, but yeah. When you were growing up, what did you think you wanted to do? I wanted to be a writer. Really? Since your youngest uh, age? I mean, when you dressed I, for Halloween, like you writing put a story. and carried a pen? I was writing stories. I mean, one of my, I was like, I was disrupting class with show and tell. And I'm sorry, it's supposed to be a quick answer. I would make up stuff for show and tell. And it would, and then I would end on a cliffhanger and the class would be disrupted. So my second grade teacher called my parents in. And she said, I would get him like a Husky pencil and a big tea <laughs> tablet and let him, let him do this in there. Let him write stories. Okay, my final question to you is, if there wasn't writing, what do you think you'd wanna do for a living? Sir, like any other profession you'd love to try? Uh, well, I mean, I, I guess a lot of what I do in my advertising work is writing or thinking about writing. It's thinking about storytelling. Um, if I was doing something completely different, uh, I think maybe photography or filmmaking. Interesting. I mean, I guess that's still sort of narrative in a way. It's but. okay. It's, cre it's the creative you. I mean, uh, you're obviously all about the creative aspect of living. So that's great. 
Jeff Abbott, I'm so thrilled that you took the time to talk to me. Tell everyone where they can find you on the web and in social media. Uh, you can find me on the web at jeffabbott.com. Uh, you can find me on Facebook under Jeff Abbott Books and under Twitter under Jeff Abbott, J-E-F-F-A-B-B-O-T-T. -T. Um, yep, that's where I'm at. And Pam, thank you so much. You are so generous to so many writers to, to share your time with them, to share your audience with them, you. and, and to share your thoughtfulness with them. It's just Aww. remarkable what you do to support thank you, thank you i hope you come back and take a guest host role one day i keep telling you that and you keep saying yeah 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 so you know you expect an email from me you tell me who you want to interview and we'll get together okay okay i want to thank everybody for being with jeff and i today please go out and get the book it is fabulous an ambush of widows let me see if i can get it in my screen an ambush <laughs> of widows i can't because i can't really see my screen there it is <laughs> there, Jeff has it better than I do. Go and get the book. It's at by Grand Central. Is the publisher? Um, I promise you, you will not be disappointed from the first page on. Jeff, thank you for being with me, and thank, thank you, you everybody. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye.